everybody. Everybody's back. Great. Um, nice to see everybody. I hope you enjoyed that discussion um, and got, got some, you know, different uh, perspectives from other people in the in the session. Uh, but I'd like to come back and just give you a, a, my kind of thoughts on this discipline variation and see if it kind of uh, maps to, uh, to what you were discussing. Okay, so just a second. So let me share my screen again. Okay, so this is the discussion that we just had. And um, I asked about how do presentations vary across disciplines. And I have a suspicion that maybe a lot of us don't really know very well how they vary across disciplines because we've never seen a discipline specific presentation. All we have is our own experience, maybe in applied linguistics or TESOL. So it's really good to see other presentations and talk to people and read about the different disciplines because there is a lot of variation and I'm going to talk about that right now. So the first thing is how does the audience vary? Well, we can have, we can imagine variation in between a novice and an expert. The, the audience in, depending on the conference and depending on the discipline, the, the participants may not know very much about the field at all. And they'll be maybe quite general, especially like IT, things like computer science. The, the audience is not very expert in the area. Um, but if you go to, a, for example, an applied chemistry conference or even maybe a medical conference, the, the audience are going to be more, more expert like. They're going to have more common knowledge so that the conference presentation will immediately jump into more specific details. They don't have to present on the background so much because everybody knows what's going on. The audience could be large versus small, which will affect how it, the delivery is done. Some conferences are always done in auditoriums, huge places with two or 300 people, whereas our conferences, for example, are often in small rooms, unless you're a keynote speaker. How many people in, this, in, our, in our session today has delivered a presentation to 300 people? Not many of us probably, unless you've done a keynote speech, but in some conferences, they're always in these big auditoriums. So the first presentation might be in front of 200 people. Some have um, chair people in chairing the session, like proper MCs, and sometimes they don't. So you need to know about that kind of variation. Of course, the pr purpose varies a lot as well. You could have conference presentations that actually don't introduce new information, they review previous information. You may have some very simple explanation kind of presentations, like in, in engineering, for example. You may have these talks which are talking more about the future, and just predictions. Business talk presentations are often talking about sales, very specific points about sales and growth over time, and it's very figure-centric and so on. You may also have different variation in organization and format. The classic difference is oral versus poster. So some conferences only give poster presentations and some have a mixture of oral and poster. So your students may never give an oral presentation. They only ever give poster presentations. So if you're teaching how to give an oral presentation, they're not gonna get much from it. They want to know how to give a poster because that's what they do. And if you teach oral skills and never teach the difference, they will go to a poster conference and give it like an oral. And it's not very effective. There's um, panels versus individual formats. So you might be on a, on a panel of three or four people, or you may be standing on your own. And this thing's about the time. It could be five minute presentations or 30 minute presentations. Our presentations in applied linguistics and TESOL tend to be about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, but many conferences only have 10 minute presentations in different disciplines. Again, you may have a chairman or chairperson like managing what's going on. The language, of course, varies as well. You have very formal presentations versus informal presentations. For example, Again, computer science, these kind of uh, IT presentations can be very informal. Nobody's wearing a suit, everybody's casual, everybody's chatting, everybody's laughing. And then you have a conference in, for example, physics, which is very formal and everybody's wearing suits. You could also talk about past and present. If you're doing experiments, then you're gonna use the past tense to talk about the experiment that you did. But again, in some fields, it's usually about what's happening now, so it's gonna be present. And then active versus passive voice. And of course, the setting and the delivery varies. I've talked about the, the room size, the small room versus the auditorium, but we also have bright rooms and dark rooms. And if it's a bright room, then 
of course, the presenter is going to be the focus of attention and body language and eye contact become important. But in a very dark room with a big auditorium and a big screen, nobody's looking at the presenter. So then you need to focus on slide design and so on. And of course, again, the or versus poster presentation is a huge difference. And we also have ways to deliver speaking from points or reading. You could have static presentations where you stand behind a podium or an active presentation where you have to move around. Business presentations tend to be active. You need to have more motion in your delivery, whereas many conferences are quite static and you can just stand and deliver. So these are the kind of things you need to consider in the classroom when you're designing your course. So if you have a course design that only considers one format, the oral presentation in a small room with 15, 20 people in the audience, and it's always about experiments, past versus present, then some of the students are going to find this very useful and others are going to find this like not very useful at all. So if you're considering multiple disciplines, you need to consider a format where you introduce lots of different types of presentation, or at least give them chances to present different things in different ways. And the, the biggest one, of course, is the oral versus presentation format. So in my course, I have a clear boundary and I teach both and give more importance to oral, but I do spend several weeks on how to give poster presentations. Oral presentations, as you can see in this photograph, is like a person standing at the front of a large audience with a screen, and that's the focus of attention. Even in a small room, basically everybody's looking at the screen. But in a poster environment, you can see here on these photographs here that there's lots of posters all happening at the same time. It's very close. It's more about Q&A. The, the poster is serving just as a, as a support for the discussion. It's not a, a presentation in the normal sense. It's more like Q&A. We can even look at the differences between posters and oral presentations like this. Oral presentations have an audience that is large and distant. It's generally logically flowing, telling a story with background problem and evaluation. We, we flow from slide to slide and point to point, and it's generally informal. Uh, and you've got the delivery with slides and body language, eye contact, voice, and so on. But if you think about posters, totally different, small, small audience, very close. You don't have a, a story format at all. It's basically a quick introduction to the poster and then Q&A. You may talk about the aims and the methods and the results, but you're probably not going to go through the details in the normal way. In terms of transitions, we're looking at Q&A transitions. So how do you initiate questions? How do you respond to questions? How do you get another question? Not the in the next slide, I'm going to show you. In the, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to talk about. You're not going to have that language at all. And this, the style is also very casual. It's almost like chatting. Um, so again, you need to consider that. And then the poster design is different from a slide design. Body language is completely different because you're not standing in front of a big audience. Eye contact and voice also diff are different. You don't need to have a strong projecting voice because they're right in front of you. The audience are next to you, so you need to speak at the normal volume and so on. So I would definitely recommend everybody in large classes with lots of different students in different disciplines, poster presentations can be really effective. They um, Poster presentations are very common in many disciplines, so it covers a lot of different fields. Multiple students can present at the same time in the classroom. You could have 10 students presenting their posters to the rest of the class at the same time. Each student gets multiple chances to deliver the same content because they keep having students coming and asking them about their research. So they're going to have to explain the same point many times, which is great for practice. The difficulty is evaluation. How do you evaluate the quality of their posters? Now you can use peer review and the students can check off points about what they thought was good or bad about the presentations. Uh, you could kind of go around each poster as a teacher and kind of listen to each student for one minute, but it does it a little bit difficult. I tend to use IC recorders and I have the student record uh, the session, the poster session, and later I listen back and hear what they talked about. You could video things as well. 
but definitely posters are an interesting possibility, which I definitely recommend. And if you're not in, in our field of applied linguistics and TESOL, we don't often do posters, but they can be the most common in many, many other fields. So definitely think about it. Okay, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about classroom management as well. Just a moment. Okay, so um, in our classes, we tend to organize lessons around individual sections of a presentation. So we don't tend to just say, do a presentation and critique everything about it, because that tends to lead to a lot of points coming at the same time. So we tend to focus on uh, like the title slide, the abstract, the background, the, the conclusions and things like that. And we focus on the mindset heading into that section. So like the mindset for Q&A, the mindset at the beginning when you start the presentation and you're nervous and you, you don't know what to say. We talk about slide design for each section, the title, background methods and so on. So um, when we focus on these different sections, we tend to use we focus on skills and language using this short one minute presentation format. So for example, if you're going to introduce the title slide or the methods, we say, okay, focus not on the whole methods, just focus on one step of the methods and in one minute explain that. So this one minute format has a lot of advantages. First, it allows for peer feedback. So students can interact working in pairs and groups to deliver a one minute presentation and then get feedback immediately on that. It means that all students can present every week multiple times. So if they're doing, I, I often have students present three one minute presentations in, in one class and they do it not just once, they will do that, that one minute presentation maybe twice. So they're doing like six presentations in a single class. So instead of having one student present for 20 minutes and then everybody listen and critique that, and then maybe another student, and then that's it. Now we have them doing lots and lots of short focused presentations. And because we're focusing on this one minute presentation, students have to think about time management. They have to think how long is it taking to get through this? And it allows students to practice very specific skills and language for different sections. And it also simplifies and targets the evaluation. So it doesn't, over, it doesn't complicate everything. We can focus on these very narrow aspects. And, but I do have the students do complete presentations twice in the semester. So the midterm, they will have a four minute presentation, still only four minutes, four slides, four minutes. And it will be basically the background to their research. And then at the end of the presentation, I have them do a 10 minute presentation because in science and engineering, 10 minute presentations are the most common length, 10 minute, maybe 12 minutes and three minutes of Q and A. So they have a real, real experience at the end of the semester, but every week they're presenting to their partners and to the class as well. And um, we do, I discuss oral and poster presentations as well, talking about the similarities and differences in terms of audience, purpose, organization, flow, style, and delivery. And we talk about design issues and delivery strategies for these different formats. Okay, so um, we have another task for you. Um, I don't think many of us here will have experienced a one minute presentation format um, that, which we introduce in our classes. And I think it was good for you to kind of see what a one minute format is like as a, imagine being a student, but also as a teacher, how do we manage a one minute presentation and how do we get students to do this? And I hope through this little example, you'll be able to see how we can rapidly have lots of people present lots of times. Okay, so this is a, a, a task, but I'll, I'll explain it. And it's really kind of how I teach the, how I teach as well. You'll see an example of what I'm doing. Okay, so in my class, after explaining the importance of presentations and how to do different things, I'll have the students do this introduction. This is a self-introduction, okay? It's basically just a self-introduction, but I format it like a one-minute presentation. So instructions. And if you go to the uh, Google Drive, maybe I could show it here. If you go to the Google Drive, you'll see we here we have task two, experiencing a one-minute presentation. So here's the information here as well. Okay, so 
when visitors come to a laboratory, because it's science and engineering, I'm doing STEM student work, they often ask what the researchers are doing there. Introduce yourself and explain what your research, and you guys are not doing maybe research so, or teaching, is about. So explain what your research is about. Structure the presentation using the checkpoints below. You have one minute, yeah? And then I give them a clear idea of what they're supposed to be saying in that one minute. So greeting, name, first name and then family name, affiliation, what's your department, what's your faculty, what's your school, what's your university, and what is your current research general area, start with general and then go to specific topic. So for example, my research area, I, I do research in corpus linguistics and at the moment I'm working on a new software tool called Ancong that will allow people to be able to analyze language without requiring programming, things like that. And then the ending words, this could be just thank you, or it could be a little bit more about, for example, why they came today, what they're doing right now in their work and so on. So this is what you're going to all have to do, everybody. So you think about this. Now, you're, you're my students now for the for next five minutes. Imagine that. OK, so how long is one minute? Do you have content for one minute? Just think about it. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Um, but look at, look, look at the screen here. When I show examples, I'm not just going to show myself giving the presentation or another student. I'm going to pick an example from a real world environment. This is Gabriel Weiss of Mitsubishi Electric. And I don't know if this is going to, just a second, can I show um, share computer sound? This should work. OK, so what I do, let's see if this is going to play. Hopefully it will. Yeah, can you see that? Is it moving? Yeah, good. And hopefully you'll get some sound as well. Hello, everyone. Can you hear that? My name is Gabriel Weiss. I'm with Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating in the US. Um, I run the Interactive Marketing Technologies Group. And basically what that means is I'm in charge of the strategy and execution for all of our interactive properties, digital media, social media, video asset generation, and technology integration for marketing and sales and service opportunities. So anywhere where there's a new or innovative piece of technology, I test it out, see if it works for us, and try to integrate it into what we're doing as a overall strategy for Mitsubishi Electric. Yeah, like that. OK, can you all hear me still? Yeah. Good. So what I've done there is instead of just using some kind of boring self-introduction from me, I've used a real conference presentation from a top guy in industry. This is Mitsubishi Electric, which relates very closely to my own students because they actually go and work at this company in the future. So this is how I kind of tailor my class to be a little bit more technical than just a, a regular presentation class. But then I'm going to give them an example of what they could say. And I'll talk about, you know, the structure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kazuhiro Suzuki, and I'm a member of the Anthony Data Analytics Group here at Waseda University, blah, blah, blah. So I will go through an example and show the coloring of the different sections of that introduction. I won't go through all of that now, but I'll also focus on some of the language points like this is conversational English. So we need to have lots of I and my and you see that it's I and you We're directly talking first person active voice. And of course, it's conversational style. So we've got I'm uh, at the moment. I'm I'm like on YouTube, things like that. So very conversational style. So that's what I want you guys to do as well, okay? So first, write the outline to your speech, okay? Greeting, name, affiliation, current research, ending words. Don't write a script though, just think of little points to write, okay? Then I'm gonna ask you to rehearse your presentation and then I'm gonna ask you to deliver it to a partner. But let's just start there. Let's just stop at step one first. So everybody, remember I've got my clock, I'm going to give you one minute, that's all, just one minute to prepare your content, okay? So you don't have time to write a script. You're just going to write a couple of points, yeah? What's your research or what, what do you teach? If you want to go about teaching, talk about teaching if you want. What's, what, what is your general area of teaching or what's your specific classes and talk about them, okay? Ready? One minute, prepare.
Lillian, are you preparing? <laughs> you don't look like you're preparing. You look like you're looking at the screen. Yeah, I think, thinking about it. <laughs> don't just think that, write a couple of points because you'll forget them. Time up, everyone. Okay, now that was one minute. Now you probably felt that that was very short. One minute felt very short to prepare. When you start speaking, one minute will suddenly feel very long because you won't have the content to last one minute. Okay, so next, so this is what I have the students do. Remember, you're my students right now. I have the students in the class do exactly what you just did. They have no time to write a script. They have no time to memorize a script. They have only time to write a couple of points. Then I do this. Okay, everybody, now I want you to rehearse your presentation. Now, I, do, I can do this at the same time with everybody together. Everybody, make sure you're listening. So what I want you to do now, I'm gonna start my clock and I want you to say your presentation, literally right now, okay? But in a quiet voice like this. Okay, good afternoon everybody. My name's Lawrence Anthony and, and I'm uh, in the uh, Center for English Language Education in the Department of, of, of Science and Engineering at Waseda University. So my current research is in the area of corpus linguistics, like that, okay? Just do it, say it. Try to actually say it with your open mouth. You can mute, mute yourself, but say it verbally, yeah? Actually use your voice. And then I'm gonna stop after one minute, but you can now see how much time it actually takes you to give this introduction. And now everybody, like we've got 29 people in the room, so 29 people can practice presentations right now. Ready? Everybody, go. Science and Engineering last year. <laughs> Kira has finished already. <laughs> Still 15 seconds. Time up. And that's what I do with my students. So this idea of one minute suddenly kind of changes perspective. When you're preparing, one minute feels very, very short. When you're actually delivering a presentation, one minute can feel very long. You have a lot of time for content. And I get students to remember this every week and they start learning to feel how long one minute is and they can start designing slides and content that fits into this one minute pattern. Okay, so some of you probably finished way early, right? Maybe after 30 seconds. So you have to think of adding one extra example, one extra point, something extra. Just, but don't go to one minute. 50 seconds is fine. 45 seconds is fine. It doesn't have to be exactly one minute, right? If you went over time, game over. Out, you fail the class, okay? You cannot go over time. You have to finish in one minute. So cut some content, just cut something. Don't speak at the end, just finish, say thank you. Thank you, finish, okay? And that's it, that's what I do with my students, okay? So I have them practice, and if they don't look like they're finishing on time, I'll do it again. I'll have them do it one more time, rehearsing in with everybody together, just quietly saying what they're gonna say until they're fairly confident that they're gonna finish in one minute. And then I break out into a group of two, two, 
and then have everybody deliver their one minute presentation to their partner, which we're going to do right now. OK, so Lucas, can you make groups of two? OK, two yeah. people. That's all. Just two. OK, now, everybody, before you go, everybody. So when you go into your group of two, you I'm going to I'm going to start the presentation. So I'm going to send a message and say, start. OK, and then you've got like one minute, give your presentation. And then um, the, the audience, just give them one comment about what was good and one comment about what was not so good. And then we'll swap. And then I'll say, start the partner two. Yeah, second person, start, and then do the same thing again. So it should all be over in four minutes. Yeah, all finished in four minutes. OK, so are you ready? Everybody good? You know what you're going to say? Go. OK, let's go to our groups, breakout groups, um, one minute introduction. Welcome back, everybody. Wendy, how was that? Was it difficult? Wendy, Tom? Oh, you need to unmute. You're muted. Yeah, a little uh, technical problem. Ah. Hi. Okay, great. Blanche, how did you oh. manage to give your presentation in one yes, minute? Yes, I've always enjoyed, you know, um, the opportunity of uh, being a student again, right? Instead of <laughs> always thinking of how to how to organize certain things, you know, and and making sure that everything is on track, right? So it's nice to be in that role. <laughs> yeah. Okay, everybody's coming back. Excellent, Mark. You look you're smiling there. Um, were you able to give your one minute presentation in on time? I think I only used about 40 seconds, so I... That's fine. <laughs> 40 seconds is actually pretty good. Uh, you don't want to be going like... Some students think that when you say one minute, they have to finish exactly at one minute, like a race or some kind of weird time. Mm -hmm. But finishing, finishing 20 seconds early is way better than 20 seconds late, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, everybody. Um, it's great to see you all back. Uh, so... That's what I do with my, basically, that's how I run every presentation in the class, except my midterm presentations and final presentations. So I'm going to give very, very focused instructions. You can see that we have all these checkpoints that they can think about. They have a very clear idea of what they're supposed to be doing. But there's also a very clear indication of time. And also, when, when they're working in groups, uh, I also have a clear indication of what the audience is supposed to do as well. So they, they sit, they listen, they give two points. What was good, one thing that was good, one thing to make it better. And then they're, they're done. They're back into the classroom again. And you can imagine how I could very easily say, okay, everybody, that was okay, but you know, some of you were a bit weak, some of you went over time, some of you were a bit too early. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, now, now just now you, you presented to the person next to you, now present to the person behind you. Okay, ready, turn around, ready, go. And then they do it again. So now they've had this self-introduction twice. They, sorry, more than twice. They had one rehearsal, maybe two rehearsals in their own head. Then they presented to one person, still a bit nervous. Then they presented to another person. They get more confidence. And then I'll say, okay, so who would like to present to the class? Yeah, Justine, yeah, good. Okay, Justine, yeah, please. Okay, thank you, Justine Chan. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, give yourself introduction to the class. Ready? You have one minute. <laughs> Justine, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, of course, students have, they have a lot of chances to be presenting. So they're gonna have, I'm, I'm not going to ask them to present to the class if they've not developed confidence. So I'm gonna be asking probably the best student in that group. Somebody who looks like they're quite um, energetic, who looks fairly confident. And then whatever they do in the class, I'm going to say that was great. <laughs> okay, Because it's all about the mindset as well. So please go ahead, Justin. You have one minute to give your presentation. Okay, go. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Chen, and I'm now working at the Center for Language in Education at the Education University of Hong Kong. So uh, my research interests are this cross analysis, um, language, English language, teaching and learning, and also some corpus linguistics. And but now I'm working on a project for the center to refine our English curriculum. So what we are doing is to um, interview some students and also some faculty representatives to know more about their English 
needs and requirements so that we can include more discipline specific elements into our new curriculum. Yeah, and that's why I'm entering, uh, ent entertaining this uh, webinar to know more about discipline specific course design. Thank you. Oh, very, very good. Wow, you're, a, you're an amazing student. You should be a teacher of English, you know? You're that good. You should be teaching. You should be teaching skills. That was, Thank you. Justine, that was amazingly good. And the, your time was uh, 50, about 50 seconds. Perfect timing. You could also see everybody else that she was speaking with confidence. She seemed to be energetic. She's like, she knows her topic. And everybody else can, maybe they don't know the topic that she's talking about, but they can get that feeling of she's got good time management, she knows what to say. And then I can ask other people to comment and so on. But we do that for everything, whether it's a title slide, a, a methods in explanation, a results. If you're in a business context, you could say, okay, so here's a product, here's a product, explain why the, or the customer might, might want to buy this. You've got one minute, go. And the same idea again, this is like, don't just say it, let them plan, give them some checkpoints to, to go through. So even Justine, I'm sure you have a lot of experience, but did the checkpoints help you as doing your self-introduction? Uh, yeah, I think because the checkpoint asked me to think about my personal you know, research interest though. So usually I don't introduce myself with the research interest. I just talked about what I'm doing at the center. Right, so it, it, it no, and they also, frames it like greeting, name, affiliation, and it has these points that they, they, the students can use to fill the time with interesting content. And so that's the idea of one minute presentations, everybody. I hope you can see the advantage of this method in that it allows us to do a lot of presentations with very focused guidance and evaluation as well. I've just realized I'm not sharing my screen, so let me share my screen again. Okay, so I could, this is what I'm seeing. So I can see you, Justine, right here. <laughs> can you see that? I'm gonna move you out of the way and let's come back and talk a little bit more then about this. Okay, so this is basically how I'm running my classes. So I'm gonna go through now, for the last hour and 50 minutes, we're gonna go through three case studies. I'm gonna have another break soonish, but after the first case study, maybe. I'm gonna show you how we, I'm gonna go even more focused now on more discipline specific content but how and then you're going to have some chance to practice uh, not practice or, or experience what we do and then in the case study three you'll I want you to try and come together and kind of create some some lesson plan for explaining figures and tables okay so let me start with this first case study about how I would go about teaching students how to avoid the common mistakes in presentations Okay, uh, so as, as I pointed out at the beginning, students have an issue with mindset. And even some of the comments from you were that they don't think it, presentations are important and so on. So I often start my, I always start my course with this idea of mindset and the importance of research and the importance of presentations. One aspect of this opening is why presenting is difficult. Why is presenting difficult? So I'm gonna discuss this and I'll show you the slides that I use in my STEM classes, okay? So I start like this. So presenting is like playing the piano, okay? Or playing tennis, like this. Uh, when you start playing the piano, it's really, really difficult. But as you keep playing, as you get older and you get more experience, you finally be able to play a concert um, like this. And in playing with playing tennis as well, initially hitting the ball's difficult, serving's impossible. But over time, you gain experience, you gain confidence, and then finally you're like Federer and you can play at Wimbledon. So you can see that presenting is a skill like sports or like playing the piano, it's a skill that needs practice. So everybody in this room, how often do you practice presenting? And of course the students will answer like never, <laughs> they, never they never present. And I say, well, that's the problem. You, when you present like once a year, you're gonna get nervous. Imagine Federer only ever played Wimbledon and never practiced. 
He would be terrible at Wimbledon. Imagine a concert pianist who never practiced, and the first time they played the piece was at the conference in front of the audience. They would be terrible. They would fail miserably. And that's why you guys are always nervous when you're presenting, because you don't practice enough, you need to practice more. So try to practice in the lab. In this class, we're gonna have lots of times to practice. You need to practice to get better. Okay, so it's not, presentations are not necessarily difficult, but they, you need the skill. But in some way, presenting is really difficult because of a few interesting aspects about presenting. So the first thing is that it's make or break for the speaker. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that you only have one chance to explain your research. If you think about it, you go to a conference, you present, and that's it. If you fail, it's going to be bad and you can't correct it, right? So what you need to do is pick a strategy. You need to choose a reliable method and practice that, okay? It could be reading a script or it could be memorizing a script, but they're generally not, well, memorizing is not reliable at all. Try and pick a, a reliable method and just keep practicing that. Um, we're, in this class, we're going to look at speaking from points. And that's uh, once you get experience with speaking from points, it can be a very reliable method that you can use everywhere. And it's also make or break for the audience because they only have one chance to understand your research, right? They come to the conference, they listen. If they don't understand, they can't stop. Maybe they can ask a question at the end, but they can't stop you in the middle of the presentation. So you need to have a strategy to introduce redundancy into the presentation. Like at the beginning, explain the direction of the presentation in the outline slide, or in the title slide, explain what the main points are going to be, and then later actually explain those main points at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of the presentation, explain them again in the conclusion. You can also explain the points in different ways, like showing it as text or using figures or tables or using your voice. You see this, everybody, this is kind of what I'm doing in the class. I'm just going through these different points. Um, I talk about time restrictions, yeah? So uh, time is really short. So time the presentation when you practice and if you have too much, cut it. Cost and money, it takes a lot of time to present. So you need to make sure to give a good presentation that has the value of the cost of going to the conference and so on. And I'll give you a couple more examples. So in terms of delivery, your delivery can turn a good presentation into a great presentation or a terrible one. So this is a, a quote from Michael Ali, who wrote a very famous book on presenting. And he says, content without style goes unnoticed. And when he says style, he means like with, um, without good delivery, yeah? And style, but maybe style without content has no meaning. So if your content is really good, but you can't deliver it well, the audience won't understand and they will forget it. But don't just have good delivery. You need to have good content too. So is your research good? Good. Is it interesting? Is it new? Is it valuable? If it is, great. Then learn to deliver it. In terms of strategies, we can think about learning to just be normal. Just be yourself. Don't, don't worry about eye contact and body language. Don't worry about all these different things. Just be yourself. Just be normal. Relax. Concentrate on the content of your presentation, the robot you're developing, the algorithm you're creating, the new compound that you've synthesized in the lab, uh, the new theory that you've come up with in your physics experiments. Focus on the content, explain that as you would explain it to your friend. But then, of course, watch yourself and watch other people. And if you have some weird delivery feature, like you keep scratching your head or you, or you rub your face, well, fix those mistakes, but ultimately be yourself. And then nerves. This is a, always a problem. If you're nervous, then you start forgetting what to say, you give the wrong information, you show distracting body movements, you start talking too quickly, you become hot, you become flustered. So controlling your nerves is a really important aspect of presentation skills in any field, whether in physics or chemistry or biology or mathematics or engineering, civil engineering, architecture, it doesn't matter. You need to control those nerves. So how can you do that? Well, first, it's basically mind control. Just control your nerves. Tell yourself, 
Ah, oh, bad presentation is not the end of the world. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. Stop thinking about yourself. This is a common reason for getting nervous. If you start thinking about your body language or how you're looking or are you looking nervous, you will become nervous. And remember, the audience are not interested in you. They don't care about you. They care about the content that you're giving them. So focus on the content, not yourself. Yeah, just be yourself, just relax. And believe in your product. This is a very common phrase in business, you know, believe in the product. Know why the content you're delivering is novel or interesting and valuable. The more you like what you're doing, that will um, transfer to the audience. But there are a few other things like learn about the setting. Okay, so how big is the room and where's the projector? And is there a pointer? Is there a microphone? Are the lights on or off? Is it bright or is it dark? And um, think about the audience. Okay, how many people will come? Where will they sit? How old are they? Um, and also the content itself. How long is the presentation? How many slides do you have? Are you going to print the slides and look at those on the, on the podium? The more you know about the setting, the more relaxed you can be. Nobody likes going to a new place. Nobody likes talking to new people. So the more you know the environment, the more you know the audience, the more relaxed you can get. Like that, everyone. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. But you'll notice here, I've given you this quick demonstration. The content here is very general, right? It's not discipline specific at all. But did you notice how I kept adding points about chemistry and biology, civil engineering? I kept dropping the words of the fields that the students are in. So I'm making very general points, but I'm trying to target the content so that they, are, they know that it's them I'm talking about. For example, I might say, how long is the presentation? And I might add, for example, you know that in many engineering fields, it's going to be about 10 minutes. But if you've got 20 slides, you're going to be rushed. So I would say that. Adding the point that it's 10 minutes, 20 slides is too many. Just these little points that I'm adding to this very general explanation. The more points you can add, the more examples you can give that relate to them, the closer it becomes to them. You'll also notice, look at the top right. Did you notice the photographs I'm using? I'm using photographs that are actually related to the fields. I'm gonna be picking photographs of real conferences in real environments that they might have seen. That's not quite my mind control. That's not exactly right, but yeah, that's the idea, okay? Just one more thing. Um, this, this, is, this is really for everybody. It's like a cool idea. I hope you like it. But I also tell the students that good presenters should be like good taxi drivers. And I ask them to like think about this and like, what is going, what is that? And I say, okay, if you're an audience, if you're, a pass, if you're on the street and you want to get a taxi, which taxi driver, taxi would you get in? And um, Kira, which Kira, I can see you on video. Which which taxi would you like? The one on the left. Neither the... of them. Neither of them. Oh God. <laughs> no. Okay. Um. Maybe the friendly one because the other okay. one looks like a serial killer. <laughs> he is. He's, this is. He is a serial killer. <laughs> this is from a movie. This is the movie. Oh, taxi. Right. Oh, this that's is... right. Robert De Niro. Is it's it Robert, Robert De, Niro. De Niro? Oh that's my right. God. Yeah. Okay. So I say to the students, yeah, like, which taxi driver would you want? Which taxi would you get in? And then I ask them, like, why did you pick that? And it's because, of course, it looks nice. He looks friendly. He looks like the taxi's clean. It looks nice. And I say, yes, because and presenters need to be the same. They need to look the part. They need to have good attire. They need to have nice looking slides. They need to look energetic. They look friendly. They don't want to look like a serial killer. But then I go on to more things like, okay, but what else is good about, uh, uh, what else does a good taxi driver do? And I start talking about, well, they, they, ask, the, they ask the passenger, where do they want to go? They don't just start driving off <laughs> into the distance, which Kira, if you got into this car and he starts driving away, it would be crazy. And I link this all to the ideas of audience and purpose, organization, flow, style, and delivery. So 
the, a, a good taxi driver first asks the audience where they want to go. And in, in a real presentation, you need to understand where the audience needs to go, not where you want to take them. You also need to think about the, well, the, sorry, this is um, just coming back. So the first is the audience, but then we also have the purpose. You ask the audience where they want to go. So you need to take them to that, to where they want to go. But you also have your own purpose as well. And you need to kind of balance the two. You also need to know the directions and how to get to the destination. So you need to have good organization, the map of the road. You need to know the map. You also need to drive smoothly. You need to, you don't want to be taking sharp corners and sharp turns. So you need to have the flow smooth. You also need to think about style. Most presenters are kind of too formal, especially in Japan. You need to kind of be more relaxed, casual. And you also need to think about the delivery, the driving itself, the slides, the point of the body motion and so on. So that's what I do. I kind of link the, these ideas of audience purpose, organization, flow style delivery to taxi driving. It's a crazy idea, but I hope you like that. Let's go on. So that was case study one, and it's now 12.30 and we have one hour left. So let's have another five minute break and then we'll go to our case study two and then we'll have the last 30 minutes talking about case study three. So is that okay? Let's have five minutes break and then we'll come to case study two looking at a science title explanation. So let's go on. Okay, so I'm going to do two more case studies over the next hour or the next 40, 40, 50 minutes. The first case study is more like the one that I gave a few minutes ago with this one minute presentation, but it's a bit more focused on now discipline specific, uh, not necessarily conference presentations, but certainly introducing the topic of the research. Okay, so uh, teaching the skills and language of starting a presentation. And it's the title slide basically, but a lot of students and a lot of even English majors and, and professionals spend too short a time at the very beginning of their presentations and they tend to rush. Just, am I sharing my screen? I should just make sure I am. I am, I am yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so how will we talk about teaching the language of the start of a presentation? And remember, I'm, I'm in STEM, science and engineering, but it could relate to lots of other fields. So the first thing I'm going to do is introduce the basic macro structure of a typical presentation. And again, coming back to Miranda, Miranda's comment, it might not always be a conference presentation, but you might want to show a variety of different types. And I tend to show product demonstrations and conference presentations. So we have the opening with the title and outline. Then we have the body with these different components, importance and general concepts, specific details, review, and so on. And then materials and methods results, and then summary acknowledgements and Q&A. Typical, this would be a typical science and engineering kind of presentation, 10 minutes. So I'm going to focus here on the first part, which is this title part. And then in class, I would normally talk about outline and summary as well. But today we'll just focus on title. So what I um, have a look, everybody, at these uh, five opening sentences from, a, from in a presentation. And just, just take it away from a student's perspective now. What I'm doing in this class is I always start with negative examples not positive examples. I start with negative examples, discuss what the problems were, and then show the students a good example. It's, best, it's good to show positive after negative. If you show positive first and then negative, people start remembering the negative things as being the correct way. So start with some negative examples that you've seen students do or you've seen in real conferences and then go to the positive ones later. So what's wrong with the following openings? Okay, guys, let's get going. And of course, I would ask the students to kind of just quickly give their opinions. With this environment online, it's not so easy, so I'll show you what I've got here. So this is too informal, maybe especially at the start. You don't want to start with, okay, guys. But good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great honor to be here today. Gets a laugh from some students. It's like, yeah, too formal, especially at an academic conference. There are not many people here today. A joke at the start of a presentation. A joke? That was supposed to be funny. But of course, an audience might not know that it's a joke and they, they miss the point. This opening suggests that the talk is not very interesting. The people in the room are not important and you are not enthusiastic about your research. This is a real opening. The students tried to say something funny, but it doesn't come across as funny. It just comes across as negative. 
What is the most important problem in the world today? Starting with a question. And of course, never start the presentation with a direct question because the audience don't know what to do. Do they answer it? Do they wait? They're going to get confused. Here's my outline. Okay, remember to frame your research using the title slide. Don't jump too quickly to the outline. So I kind of use these examples as, as starting points for this title slide explanation. Here's some of the things that students have done in the past, which are bad, and you might want to kind of improve on these. I might even show videos of bad openings at this point from real conferences using YouTube videos, maybe. Okay, and then we get to this. So what I would do then is go through and explain how I give a real conference presentation slide. Now, I actually use my own for this in my own classes, but you could use somebody else's. But um, on demand now, we've got an on demand, I'm using on demand videos now. So I sit and actually go through and show these examples of these real conference presentations. And this is a real conference. And as before, as you saw before, I kind of go through and I look at the structure and talk about the language that I'm using. And here you can see, hello everyone, my name is Lawrence Anthony and I'm from the center, blah, 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 blah. I want to talk today about a new software program that I've developed that allows users to blah, blah, blah. And this is all real, basically. It's not exactly what I said in the real conference, but I give them an example first, show an example. Then I talk about the language points from that example, like direct first person active voice, focusing on I and you, connecting with the audience, don't say audience, <laughs> say you, actually the real people in the room, talk about we, and so on. And then um, talk about these linking phrases like hello everyone and I want to talk today about, as you know, so things like that, just these linking phrases. And then I'll, once I've gone through those, I'll kind of summarize these points like this. So the basic structure is greet the audience, say who you are, give your affiliation, expand your title into a sentence. This is an important point, yeah? Expand your title into a sentence. So don't say, coming back, assist in the vocabulary. No, no, no. Today, I'm going to talk about assessing the vocabulary complexity of technical documents. Today, I'd like to talk about assessing the vocabulary of the comp. Today, the title of my talk is assessing the vocabulary, blah, blah, blah. So I talk about expanding the set title into a sentence and then describing the main goal of the presentation, like summarizing the main points, which a lot of people forget. So after you say the title, don't just finish, go on, summarize the main points because you've got one minute to, for this title slide. And then I'll talk about some of the language points, like the basics of greeting, memorize a fixed phrase, say your name slowly, <laughs> When you say your affiliation, it's I'm in the department, in the faculty, at the university, things like that. Just little language points. The topic, memorize a fixed phrase because you're going to be nervous at the beginning. So today I'm going to talk about, say, the title. And then the details like situation, present tense, linking phrases. So today many companies are blah, blah, blah. Then maybe talk about the problem that you're going to discuss in the presentation. Again, in present tense. But one of the problems is, so I, this is what I'm doing with my students. Yeah, focusing on the, the basic structure, the language points. I'm going to come to strategy in a moment. And then when you talk about the, the response to the problem, you're going to be using future tense because the presentation hasn't started yet. Yeah. So in today's presentation, I'm going to introduce the problem. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to explain. So future tense with linking phrases. And then, as I said before, focusing on strategy. So start strong, memorize the first line, project energy, interest and excitement. Talk to the audience, look at them at the beginning. Don't start looking at the slide, look at the audience at the beginning and during the transitions from slide to slide. Look at the screen when you're giving details. Look at the audience when you're adding extra points, like the main points or the explanations of the examples. And slow down. Don't rush the opening. Give yourself one minute maximum, not one second, not three seconds, which a lot of students do. Today, I'm going to be talking about corpus linguistics. Here's the outline. <laughs> Whoa, who are you? What are you talking about? What's corpus linguistics? 
So slow down, don't rush the opening. Give yourself maximum one minute. It could be 30 seconds, 40 seconds, but not three seconds, not four seconds. And that's what I tell the students. You, you get the idea, yeah? I'm going through this. I'll do this for everything. Structure, language points, strategy. And then I have the students present. Now this is a real key point for everybody today. This is a, a, a hopefully a really useful strategy that you can adapt for your own teaching. I have every student explain the same slide. So I have a fixed topic. I'm gonna to use my slide, I'm gonna give it to the students and everybody presents the same slide first, first. And then for their homework, they modify this slide into their own topic, their own research. But in class, I don't want students to be like talking about all kinds of different things and like, and not controlling the environment. So everybody first talks about improving assistive robots uh, for practical use in Japanese society. Everybody <laughs> is like, okay. So I, I picked this topic because it's in science and engineering. It's not exactly for everybody. Chemists and physicists might not be interested, but everybody kind of gets the idea of the topic. It's general enough that everybody can understand it, but it's also specific enough to be, yes, we're in science and engineering. So if you're in business, pick some general business topic. If you're in medical science, just pick some general topic, but have everybody focusing on that one topic. So I want everybody here, I want you everybody to imagine again, you're a student in my class and your task is to present this slide, okay? You have one minute to, Imagine you're presenting this topic of improving assisted robots for practical use in Japanese society. And of course, you don't know anything about practical robots in Japanese society, but let me go on. Just before I do go on, if you go to the um, tasks, you'll see that we're on to task three now. So we're going to be looking at this task, presenting a title slide. Okay. So have a look at that while I, I explain this point. Okay, so the idea is that every student is going to be doing the same thing, which allows me to talk about language points, it allows me to control the content and control the time and make sure everybody understands what they're doing. So what are the main points to communicate? Well, we first have a greeting. Hello, everyone. Hi, then your name. So remember Justine earlier? Great. Like before, just like before. Affiliation, you did it before, do it again. I'm in the department of blah, blah, blah. And then the topic, what's the topic? Well, everybody is talking about the same topic. Don't forget, everybody's on the same topic. Today, I want to talk about approving assistive robots in Japanese society. It's exactly the title, okay? Improving assistive robots for practical use in Japanese society. But then we have a problem, everyone, because you need to continue and say the main points of the presentation. So what are they? That's why I control it. That's why I want to control the topic because I want to give them the main points that they have to say. I don't want to rely on them knowing them themselves. So here, everybody, here are your main topics. First, you have to say the situation. Many companies make assistive robots today. Yeah. Like Sony, you know, Sony, Honda, they make them. They are interesting to watch. These robots are kind of fun. They're interesting. They walk around. Yeah, cool. But they're not very practical. For example, have you ever seen a, re a, ro a robot walking around in a hospital helping elderly patients? Never, right? Never. They're not around yet. They're not practical yet. So today, I will, notice now the language is future tense. I will review current assistive robots and describe what we need to do to make them more practical. Have you got it? Got it? Right. So everybody, remember, you're my students, right? So in the class, this is what I would explain to the students. And I would say, okay, got it, everyone? Okay, you have one minute. Now, just practice this. Ready? <laughs> like, like no chance. They have no time to write a script, memorize a script. They've just got to say these, these points. Okay, ready? Do it though. Please, everybody, try and do it. You can mute your mic, but just try it. One minute. Ready? Go. Hello, everybody. My name is Lance Anthony, uh, and I'm in the Department of Engineering in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Okay, ready?
Hello everyone, I'm Wendy Tom. I'm in the Department of English. Today I'm going to talk about uh, communication skills uh, generally required for um, business. Wait, 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 Wendy, you mute. I think I need to mute you for a moment. Time up. Okay, everybody. So, I, I, I heard, if you all heard, did you hear, I think Wendy was on the mic, but if you heard that Wendy wasn't talking about improving assistive robots in Japanese society, she was, she changed the title to her own research. Don't do that, okay? Don't talk about your own work. Talk about assistive robots in Japanese society. I always have to say this like five times to the students. The first time we do it, they never get that. Once they get it, the second week, the third week, we're fine. But every week I'm going to be using this presentation as a template for them to be practicing. And then they go away later and replace the content with their own. But first it's like this. So everybody, are you good? It's pretty easy, right? One minute, no problem. And it's, dis it's definitely discipline specific. This is real kind of assistive robot kind of research. Okay, so then what do I do? If I notice students haven't actually got it, I would correct them. If they look like they're finishing too early, I would say, well, you can always add a couple of examples. You know, many companies make assisted robots today. For example, Honda makes the Asimo robot and um, uh, Toyota makes the Totna partner robot. You might see it in a karaoke box and things like that. Just add, add points. Okay, then I get them to actually practice it with a partner. Now we do have a bit of time so we can do it, but it's a little bit more, it's a bit tricky to do it with this because what I want them to do with the partners is not to read this script. They can only see that. Okay. So I ha in a classroom environment, I can force them to only see this, right? But you could go away and start reading the script again. But the idea is if you go back to these notes, you'll see that these are the checkpoints, but I've also included, hopefully it should be here, just the slide itself. So what the student should be doing is looking just at this slide like that and then doing the presentation. And it's not easy now because now you need memory. The students need memory. They need memory of the structure can you remember the structure, everyone? And I'd say this to the students. Remember the structure? What is it? Greeting, name, affiliation, topic, background. Yeah, situation, problem, response. Now, that's not so simple right now. Yeah. Um, Adam, you're there. Were you, did you practice? I did. Yeah, okay. Can you, like, let's just listen to Adam try and do it then, okay? But don't. Don't look at the um, don't look at the script. Just try to look at the main screen. Okay. Okay. You have it. you have one minute to give this presentation. Ready? Go. Hi, my name's Adam. I'm at the English Language Centre at the Poly U. Uh, good morning, and I'm going to talk today about improving assistive assistive robots for practical use in Japanese society. Um, I'm going to be. The problem is they, they look good, but they're not very practical. They they're, uh, actually don't do much. So I'm going to be talking about the problem, and then I'm going to be talking about how we can improve it. Uh, my presentation will last about 10 minutes, and there'll be time for questions at the end. Thank you. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah, we, we, was... we, do, we do this in our university course, so it's easy for me. Ah, but <laughs> the poly you teachers. But now know. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna critique you as well, as well. Adam. I hope you're okay. So that was 33 seconds. So sure. actually you were a bit short. And did you notice you missed an important part of the presentation? There was something I missed. I can't remember what it was. Though. The situation. You didn't you, you started I, I... immediately with the problem and didn't actually set up the situation before that. Mm -hmm. Why you probably finished a little bit early. You I, was, I was speeding up as well because what you said earlier, you, you yeah. speed up. And you also said, hi, I'm Adam. And probably in, a, in, in, in depending on the conference, you'll probably need to say your full name because just saying Adam might, be, might sound overly informal for certain conferences or certain events. So definitely check when you go to the conference and see how, do, you know, do people use their full name or do they just have a more mm -hmm. casual, informal approach?
Like that, everyone. Adam, that was great. It was really good for the first time to do this. But hopefully students listening to Adam or listening to other students would notice, oh, he didn't say um, many companies make assistive robots today. He went straight to kind of a lot of, you kind of said it, but you kind of blurred it together with the second second step about being not very practical. And also the final thing was a bit vague. This review, describe. <laughs> right. So when you do it again, everybody, remember the two things you're going to do. I'm go I will review assistive robots. I will describe what we need to do to make them more practical. Yeah. So Adam, can you remember? Ah, uh, me again. Yeah, right now. Can you remember? So situation, so many. Um, many. Okay, so ma many companies in Japan and worldwide are making these assistive robots today. Um, and uh, they look good, but they're not very practical. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the current I will situation. review. I will do I need to use review? I'm going to review the current situation and then I'll give, you'll give some suggestions about how we can make them better, more practical. Excellent. Great job. Now, of course, as a student, I might give you more. Yeah, as, a, as a native speaker, I don't need to correct you. But with students, they're going to go like, I, uh, 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 and I'm going to say review. And they, they go, yeah, OK, I'm going to review current assistive robots and uh, describe. OK. Mm. And then they continue. So I just need to give a couple of words to help them get through that. But already you can see probably that Adam is getting like super confident with being able to do this. And it's only been practicing it like two minutes. So if everybody now has a go, okay, you all have to go to your room again. You have uh, exactly like before. So we, this is now repeating things. So we're going to have a four minute, one minute to present, then 30 seconds, 40 seconds for feedback from the audience. Now the audience's feedback now is really clear. So you just have to note, did the presenter have greeting, name, affiliation, topic, situation, problem, response? Did they say those points? If not, tell them which points they missed. And then we swap. Everybody good? Okay, and uh, let's go to a breakout room. So, Okay, everybody, welcome back. I, I can see most people are here. So, um, am I sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing for a second. Okay, let's put you all here. So, um, I hope you were able to um, experience what students experience in my classes. And um, there was, we had, while you were away doing your one minute presentations, I, I was talking with Lillian again, and it was related to the comment that Miranda made earlier about, oh, maybe not many people are teaching conference presentations to students. So you have to remember that you should always know the goals of your course at the beginning, which is why I started out with the four, those four pillars of course design. So in the courses I'm, I'm showing you that the goal of our courses are uh, basically ultimately conference presentations because our th my classes are third year and fourth year students who will be presenting in labs and will be wanting to go on to graduate school like 85 percent of our students go to graduate school and they will be presenting in conferences later so clearly the ultimate goal of my course is to develop the skills for conference presentations but not everybody's course will be that way so I'm not saying that if you teach presentations, you have to focus on conference presentation skills. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying that, I'm saying make sure that you are clear what your goals are and what the needs and so what are the wants, what are the lacks, what are the necessities to be able to achieve those goals. Go to the, go to the actual classes that they, for example, if they're presenting in classes, go to those classes and see the students present and see what they actually do in a physics case reports discussion, for example, or go to a lab and see what a seminar looks like and what the, do the students do in those seminars. And, you know, you only need to see a couple or three to get a, re, a, a fairly good idea of what's happening because you have your own experience as well. So these, these and the, the other thing I was making a point about is by by having short 
focused presentations like these one minute presentations, you can introduce a lot of variety into the class as well. So you're not like having everybody do a conference presentation for 20 minutes. You can have one minute presentations on sales or one minute presentations on reviewing literature or one minute presentations critiquing something or one minute presentations showing and telling. You could literally have a show and tell for like, here's a clock. You have to talk about this for one minute, go. It's like, how can you talk about this for one minute? Well, you then think about structuring. And if, you, if it's a sales kind of presentation, you could think about the sales points of, of this clock, why it's important, how it can be used, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I use the example of conferences in my talks because that is the goal that I have for my class. And that's the example I'm using. But try to always go beyond just the examples I'm showing in this session to your own context and how you would adapt the four pillars of course design to your context. What examples would you use to explain what you need to explain? And uh, yeah, the level I'm talking about here as well is definitely undergraduate level and students, every student I teach can easily handle the level that we're doing right now and you know of course you all can handle it as well but anyway how did you feel about that one minute presentation using a title slide did you notice it, it the slide itself focuses the content that you have to talk about that that content so it controls the environment it allows the audience to know what to look for because they're going to have to do it as well they have the same points that they're going to have to say they have the same language points that they have to use so they can more easily look at your presentation and evaluate it. So, of course, ultimately, you don't want everybody to be talking about assistive robots. You want them to be talking about their own work. But that's why you can start with some fixed template presentation and then go on to their own work later. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen and um, show a couple more slides. I would like to normally, I'd, of course, I'd like to talk and have some people's comments on how that that went, but we are a little bit rushed for time now. Okay, so um, later, please reflect on that that and think about the advantages of using a fixed slide for everyone to practice. But what are the disadvantages of that approach? In particular, which sections of a presentation, wherever it is, can this be easily used for, and which are going to be not so easy? Uh, for example, like creating a template results slide that's authentic is going to introduce some problems because it's going to be beyond the scope for some people to even explain and certainly to discuss. So um, you, 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 you can't use it everywhere, but it's certainly, a, a, I think, a useful, interesting approach. And have you used a similar strategy in your own class? And if yes, great. And how did it go? And if not, why not? and maybe you could try it as, as a way to control the environment. Of course, I do have student homework afterwards, and their homework would be to design a single slide showing the title of their research, then present it. And, and right now they do it with videos because we're online now. So they, they film a video of their one minute presentation. I, I, I watch their videos and I have a grading rubric in my Moodle system and I just click the points and make some comments based on that. But everybody's doing the same thing, so it really becomes very, very easy to grade this kind of work as well. Okay, a bit worried about time, but let's go quickly to uh, uh, case study three, and we'll have another, hopefully, uh, maybe a little bit rushed for time. I hope we can have a bit of a discussion of this. Maybe as a whole group, we can discuss this. Maybe that will save a bit of time with moving people around. Okay, so based on what we've just been talking about, Imagine you are teaching a session on presentation figure explanations in science and engineering. So this is not necessarily a conference presentation, but like explaining results is a key feature of basically every kind of technical presentation. So what skills and language points would you introduce in the session? And using this example here that you can see on the screen and also in the in the drive folder, what steps would you follow in the session and how would you create some kind of lesson plan for this? So let's maybe, maybe, I would like to actually get you into groups of four to discuss this, but we have only got 16, well, 15 minutes left. So maybe it is better just as a free discussion here, thinking about combining all the things that we've talked about so far today, how would you approach teaching a science and engineering class on 
figure explanations. And here's an example figure of global primary energy consumption. It's a real figure, of course. So for, first, can I maybe just ask a few people to give some comments on what are the skills that you would need to be able to explain figures and tables? Uh, maybe I just start the ball rolling. For example, when uh, students describe the trend, they need to say some languages uh, to use a, a variety of patterns to describe the increasing trend or uh, the uh, increase at different uh, rates. You right. say, for example, a, a steep increase or just an increase steadily, slightly, etc. Very good. Okay, that's Linda, yeah? So yes. Linda's talking about language part. I was referring to skills, but let's go to language points first. It might be easier to work with then. So when you think about language points, the, Linda's made a very important point about trends because figures and take, well, especially figures tend to show trends, increases, decreases, fluctuations. Uh, in chemistry, we have reach and e equilibrium. Um, so they need to know the, the verb reach and that equilibriums are reached. We don't meet an equilibrium, we reach an equilibrium. And uh, for example, age increases, age doesn't grow, right? You don't say the age grows, you say age increases, but then you might have like energy grows or energy increases. And you have to think about these different verbs that go with these trends. Great point, Linda. What are the language points then? Let's go to language. What are the language points would you need to introduce in a session? Like re referring to the to the chart so as you can see from fig from a chart yeah uh, excellent um, point and what tends do you use for for that adam uh present tense yeah present active voice usually right <laughs> so the students need to understand that when you're talking about the figure itself it's present tense yeah in this figure mm. you can see this figure shows but when you're referring to the content in the figure, then you might end up referring to past tense because like in 1850, the energy was. So you okay. might, so if you're referring to data from the past, you might want to be using past tense for the data, but for the figure itself, it has to be present. This figure shows, not showed. This figure showed the energy consumption. What? No, it shows. Yeah, great, Adam. What other points, anybody? Language points. Are we talking about reasons like why? Or, oh, right. So then that like cause effect. Uh, yeah, well. This so is the cause or so this, this was is, due to. <laughs> great. You're putting so many ideas there, Adam. That's fantastic. So first you have logical structuring. So cause effect. Why did this happen? Because you could talk about that aspect. So this increased because blah, blah, blah. So cause and effect, or you could also introduce logical structures like chronological structuring. So you could say in 1800, it was this, then in 1900, it was this, and then more recently, it is this. It's chronologically ordering the information or cause effect. But also we have the other aspect that Adam was saying is reasons and you may not know the reason and if you don't know the reason but you have an idea then you have the idea of hedging yeah you know, offering opinions with could should might may and all these hedging devices this figure suggests this figure indicates this figure shows this figure demonstrates so you have these very varying verb forms and modal forms that will introduce hedging great points adam what are any other language points anybody well, describing the data just in general, for example, giving a variety of different language to describe the same type of data, for example, increase, substantially increase, you know, yeah. no, it's giving them different ways to say the exact same thing. Right, so right. Either there was no change or, you know, everything yeah. stayed the same for the four yeah. years and then began to rise uh, substantially. Exactly. As and and interestingly, what you will find if you if you do corpus linguistics, um, you get some research papers and analyze them. You'll find that different disciplines use different verbs for the same thing as well. So you'll find that there's a trend for this verb for this field and this verb for this field and this way of saying things for this field. So it might be interesting to look at how different fields use verbs, for example, in different ways. And then you also have language like just. Uh, as you can see, well, I think Adam, may, or one of you mentioned this, as you can see here, 
might be for the title, but also just for specific points. You can see here, crude oil has a value of 80,000 terawatts hours. You can see here, so you, it's now we're using second person active voice, yeah? You can see here. Why is it you? Because you're speaking to the audience and you want them to engage. What about skills though? Does it, nobody said anything about skills. What skills do you need to develop? Looking at the audience, not looking at the chart. Yes, exactly. But when do you when do you look at the audience and when do you look at the chart? Because you have to look at the chart sometimes. You don't really have to look at the chart. You can just, you know, gradually. Yeah. That's a you skill. Can, that's I, a I skill, Mark. <laughs> Mark, that's a students have is <laughs> there somewhere. <laughs> Mark, that is a skill that only weather forecasters have developed for TV. <laughs> you can see over here that the the wind is yeah. I actually have my students use a small, put the graph on their cue card. So actually they don't have to look back because right. I, I teach them never to turn their back on the audience because then you lose that connection. But essentially I... standing beside and, and going to one point. But I think students, the biggest mistake is they focus on every data point. Yes. Really important. So you should be yes. focusing on what is really important. And then right. Because you're yes. treating them like infants. If you, it, they can see what you see. So you're yes. there to explain the importance of that graph, not every point of the graph. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a the, uh, Max introduced a whole lot of skills and strategies right there. Uh, somebody else, Mabel, said language of approximation, highlighting the relevant data to demonstrate certain points. Yeah. So there's a few things here. First, about pointing. A lot of students don't even know how to use a pointer. They wave it around too much instead of actually pointing at specific points. So if I look at my pointer here on my screen, you can see here that we have the global primary energy consumption. No, we can't. We can see my, my pointer waving around. You need to learn, they need to learn how to point at different specific areas and not wave around. In terms of body language and eye contact, Mark says he never has them turn their back on the audience, but I have a different view on this. I think it's really hard to point without, I think it's really hard to engage with the slide without actually looking at it. So I tell my students a very simple idea that if you want the, stu if you want the audience to look at the slide, you can look at it too. But if you want to talk to the audience and you want them to focus on you, you need to look at them. So you need this interaction between the two. So at the beginning, you can look at the slide and say, here, you can see, and you can turn away and look at it and point to it. And they all look with you. But then when you come back and give a reason why this is increasing, then you don't need the slide anymore because you're not using the slide. So then you can say to the audience directly. And one of the reasons for this growth, of course, is, and then speak directly to them. So it's kind of an interplay between pointing at the slide and then pointing to the audience and sorry, looking at the audience. And I would guess very few people can point without looking. So if Mark is saying that he never has them look at the screen at all, I would say that they're not then pointing at the screen, which would then limit the amount of interaction they could have with the, with the slide itself. Well, they're not turning around. They're moving to the side. And ah, and then pointing like this. Because I ah, yes, stand yeah, 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 yeah. in front of the screen because yeah. tend, most students tend to stand to the side of a screen. Yes, yeah, and, yes, 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 yes. And, so, yes. and they're the presentation. So I want them front and center. And when they need to refer, then they move over to the ah, side. Ah, yeah, yeah. And then so, they come back front and center. So these are all great points about body language now. But notice now, everybody, this is a really important point. We are focused only on results, right? Because we're focused on the results slide, we can give quite careful instruction about body language we don't just say like talk to the audience now we can be quite precise about when we are talking to the audience and when we're interrupting and how we're pointing and what we're pointing at so you're talking about like don't turn away from the audience like that you can still have your body facing the audience and still point right mm -hmm. by looking at the audience and still point like that it's still facing the audience but because we're on a very specific slide of the presentation, we can introduce these ideas in a more controlled environment, in a more clear way. Excellent, everybody. Nobody talked about slide design, but we could also talk about the skill of designing a slide that's easy to see and read and understand. We can talk about the axes. Sorry, like, say again. 
do you tell your uh, instruct your students to introduce to describe what each axis no is? i say exactly the opposite don't introduce the axes unless they're not obvious unless they're not obvious Good. yeah so um these are aspects that you could consider and if you look at the task the task i actually have these points listed up but do's and don'ts when explaining figures and tables slide design transitions into the slide overviewing the main content what are the main points and the language of that? How to give generalizations and conclusions and opinions. So that leads to hedging. Things about voice, like stressing the important point with a louder voice or a, a, a different intonation. Body language about wave pointing, hand waving and so on. Like showing things go up and down and using hands to show those. Lots of things we can do. So in my class, I have a whole lot of slides on this and I won't be able to show all of these today because we're running out of time, but I'll just give you a couple of, I'll just quickly just skim through some of these to show you. So of course I showed my macro structure and I focus in on results and discussion. I give some examples of poor designs first. Remember I said earlier that I always show some bad examples before good examples. Here's a terrible slide. Yeah, it's got bad fonts, it's got bad, Look at the 2011 split. There's some horrible spacing. The fonts are ugly. It's too small. It's straight from Excel. You need to think about expanding it and growing it into a better looking design. You can also talk about animation. Hope you can see this, but you can use animation in the slides to highlight important points instead of having to point at everything with your hand. Coming back to what Mark said about trying to talk to the audience, if you have control of the animation, you don't have to point it because you can animate those, those points. So I talk about slide design. I then show an example of a bad explanation, a classic bad explanation, like, sorry, it's a, li a little difficult to see. <laughs> it's like, why are you saying that in a presentation if you haven't designed your slide properly? You know, don't have that, yeah? So you can see the results here, you can see the results. And then things like reading the title, but not saying it pr in a full sentence. Like Japan society is not a sentence. It needs to be from the Japan society. Things like this. I just go through all these points. On the left is the research area and on the right is the number of projects. Yeah, we can see that. We don't need to read the axes when they're obvious like that. And then all of these little points, all the data points are being read out. I would spend a lot more time in class on this, but the point here is don't just read everything in the slide. You need to summarize the points into a clear message. Yeah. So here's what you should be doing. And you have these three different sections where you introduce the slide, then you talk about the main points, and then you talk about some kind of conclusion about it. And I do this kind of thing. I, I kind of visualize it like this. So, okay, if everybody here, you can see a, 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 a table showing the grand A for scientific research uh, distribution from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science between 2011 and 2014. And uh, here you can see that biological sciences get the, the majority of the budget, about 40-45% over the four years of the study. And if you look at science and engineering, which we're all members of, you can see that the actual number of projects drops. The number of projects given funding is dropped from 30 to 22%. Well, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that the government has changed its policy on funding science and engineering research, and they're trying to put more emphasis on interdisciplinary research, which is why the others category has gone from 2.7 to 16.4% over the four years. So if you want research, if you want research money in science and engineering, it's probably good to get involved with other people like that. Yeah. And then I talk about things like the voice, how you can introduce with uh, present active voice or present passive voice. I talk about the verbs that we can use. This again talks about what Mark's saying about variation in the language that you can use. Generally, we use show, but we can also use give or present or uh, provide and things like that. Uh, I'll then, I'll talk about, I'll, I'll talk about different ways of talking about the main points. I'm just gonna go quickly through this. And then how you can strengthen the points by using tense variation past tense is weaker than present tense. And notice my examples here, like temperature, I'm using as a science and engineering example going through here. And hedging, I'll talk about hedging, um, different ways of doing hedging, I'll just skip these. <clears throat> but ultimately we get a sent, there's lots of ways to do hedging, but what we end up with is a sentence like this, 
So you'll probably agree that our software can serve as a useful alternative to commercial applications in English speaking countries. So you'll have this distancing, not by hedging by using you, but you'll also have this adverbial form to hedge. You'll also see the context is limited to hedge it within, to be within a certain context and also modal verbs. So you can use all these different hedging devices to achieve that. And that's what I kind of do. And then, of course, the task for the students is to explain the global trends in energy consumption in a one minute presentation, transitioning into the slide, giving an overview, giving the main points, giving some generalization, using hedging and using voice to stress the important points. So they would, for their homework, they would get that slide and they would present it. And that's it. That's how I'm doing my presentation classes. And looking at the time, we're over time, so I need to finish on time. So um, uh, I'm going to skip the very last bit I was going to talk about, which is about teaching in a global, in, um, in, in a, pan, a time of pandemic. Um, basically, we have to teach online now. And this is how I'm teaching with all these different cameras and computers. And uh, online, there's a lot of disadvantages because controlling groups like today, you go into breakout groups and I can't see what you're doing. So it makes it more difficult to manage what's happening, but it makes some things easier because we're able to immediately randomize the groups and get everybody into groups and bring them back very, very quickly. So there's a lot of advantages to Zoom presentations and Moodle learner management systems, but there are some challenges. Um, I do give some, some advice here about how to deal with um, online teaching. And my main point here is basically watch some YouTube videos and watch how YouTubers manage explaining things like cooking or programming or music theory. They've been doing this for years and years and they've mastered the art of online teaching. So definitely have a look at like YouTube videos and then see how you can use some of these ways in your own classes, especially using these management systems and messaging systems for, for communicating with students and for grading and so on. And hopefully by using some of these, you can improve your own teaching. Okay, so I will finish there. I'll, I'll just put up the summary of the points. Uh, but three hours has gone past, gone, for me has, has flown past, but I hope for you as well. It's been an interesting three hours and useful three hours. And if you have any questions, I will stay around for a little bit longer and you can always email me as well. There is uh, one, I mean, uh, a couple of colleagues already shared some of their experiences and feedback and comment, but uh, one question from um, Adam, just asking about your experience in Japan, yeah. about hybrid, hybrid teaching, um, has okay. that started? It has. You know, it, so do you know what I mean by hybrid? Like oh, hybrid absolutely, yeah. Where you yeah. have students in class and online at the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. So, so it has started in Japan and lots of universities have started adopting that approach. So they have, they have live students in the class and anybody who can't come to class can take the class online. Some universities have adopted the on-demand approach so that the class itself is filmed. So everything that's happening in the classroom is filmed. Well, not, not with the students. And then those videos are uploaded to the students later. The other approach has been to have live on like Zoom running at the same time as the class so that the online students can basically take part like everybody else. And then the teacher has a computer with the on, online people as well as the people in the room. Luckily, <laughs> Waseda University has not adopted either approach and we had just gone on demand or online, online only. We don't have any face-to-face -face classes yet for, think, for, for science and engineering. <laughs> Unluckily, some universities in Hong Kong were going to be doing hybrid from next semester. It's a nightmare. Everybody has said, everybody I've talked to has said. All of you teachers, close your nightmare. ears. Um, the problem yeah. is, it's all about, the we problem know. is class management. It's yeah. really difficult. If they're, if they're live in the classroom, but they're on a computer monitor, it's easy to forget them because they're people in the room. Mm. We also, there's also these crazy setups where you have one student in the room and like 30 people online. Yeah. And then it's like, how do you manage that? Um, yeah. Really, really difficult. I think if you're going to, I would probably say, if you're going to be doing a, a hybrid approach, 
the idea of filming and then having the on-demand version later is probably the, the easiest for teachers to manage, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would probably recommend for in that case is to properly film the on-demand set of materials and then just leave it online for future reference. Because I, I created some very advanced, well, I, I consider it to be quite advanced on-demand videos with multicam and so on. But I can use those for review later. I can use those for years and years, I hope. The content won't change dramatically and students can watch those videos as review of the class uh, later. So maybe that would be the way to go. Yes. A lot of challenges. <laughs> a lot of challenges. Yeah. 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 We, luckily, mm -hmm. we probably will go back to face-to-face -face teaching next year, I would say. But for, mm -hmm. until 2022, we're on, online. I guess it's a problem that we have some students who still cannot come back to face to face. That's right. So. We have the same. We have about four to six percent of our students, like in China. A lot of our students are from China and they mm -hmm. can't come across. So we have to teach. We have to cater for everybody. And that means that they're on online yeah. for English uh, disciplines, actual like chemistry and physics. They are hybrid in some cases, but when they are hybrid, they are filmed and then mm -hmm. put online for the, the other students to watch. That's how yeah. they're doing it right now. Oh, brilliant workshop from Kira. Thank you very much, Kira, for that very kind comment. Yeah, uh, excuse, excuse me. Yes. Can I can I have a quick question? Um, I just want to know your thoughts about, you know, uh, are you guys like having the students uh, prepare the presentation by allowing them to have their own note cards? Okay, so um, I... I explain a lot about delivery and I, I talk about a reliable method being the most important. And I also talk about the context of different conferences and, and different presentation environments, not demanding this very front facing presentation style. There's a lot of presentations that I've done in dark rooms where the presenter is in the corner of the room and this is massive screen that everybody's watching. So notes, reading a script, totally fine. I think they just need to know the variety that, that they might be exposed to. Speaking from points is generally a, a recommended approach because it's so flexible. It can be used basically in any environment. Reading note cards, I think, I think if they're not writing a script, it would work very well. And I even used to do that myself. I used to use note cards myself. Um, I, think it's yeah. a good, I, I think it's a good strategy, but I, I would also recommend that students move away from note cards and start focusing on the information on the screen. Like make sure that if their slides are designed well, they shouldn't need note cards because the notes are the screen. The screen should be the notes that they're using. Right, because, because normally the lower intermediate or you know, even like upper intermediate, they still you know, need some thing you know, with them mm -hmm. uh, just to yeah. help them, you know, yeah, right. When they yeah. present. My, my, my goal for the class though is, I, I want students to be able to create a good set of slides and be able to deliver those with very little preparation. That's the ultimate goal. Like everybody today, you, everybody here, right? You were able to present the, that, that robot slide basically without any preparation at all. You just had a couple of ideas and that was enough. And that's what I really aim for with all my class. And if you look at some of the method slides or the result slides, you get the same messages from them. So no preparation at all, basically. You just look at the slide, you know the content, just say it. Thank you, mm. yeah. Mm. Right, um, yes, people can stay behind, but I really want to thank uh, <laughs> Lawrence for his, uh, well, you can see there more, more really uh, great comment uh, about your webinar and workshop. So thank thanks you. for your very, I would say very um, concrete uh, suggestions and very insightful activities that you have shared with us. Um, very special, I think, very special uh, workshop um, that you. we could really get into specific um, ideas and tasks that I think we can really um, apply in different uh, situations. So that's really great. And I also want to thank uh, all the participants here we now got 16 left here but uh thank you for staying with us until the end um and also thank you for supporting the hub uh this 
is our last event. And um, just want to remind you that uh, on the website, you can see the materials uh, and also the recording. And um, also uh, from even the last week's one and uh, the other two uh, sharing and discussion sessions that we had in these two weeks, they are already up on the website. So um, and I'll be we are really that. keeping uh, things up to date. I'll be uploading Sorry? the slides from now as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, so please visit uh, the, the Hub website and there are many other um, resources there, including uh, projects from different centers. So you can also get to know more about what the other centers are doing and contact each other. You, I think a lot of you are members of the Hub, so you can actually also see the uh, uh, the expertise and also area, uh, research interests of colleagues. So get in touch and uh, keep connected with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Any... everybody. It's been a real pleasure to meet you all and see you all online like this. Um, I wish yeah. I could go. I wish I could be there, but um, it's it's nice to be able to see you in this environment as well. <laughs> yes, hopefully in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.